So John chapter 6 is where we're going to be today. Uh, so if you've got your Bibles, you can go to John 6. If you don't, I'm going to have it right here on the TV for us. Uh, but here's what we're going to look at. This is, the, uh, this is a unique um, story. It's a miraculous story. And it's unique because this story is actually mentioned in all four Gospels. It's one of the only miracles that's actually mentioned in all four Gospels. So Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, all four of them stop to tell this story. And each one of them, each one of the Gospels, written by four different people, they would tell the story with a little bit different perspective, right? If you were there and you saw something happen, you would articulate it one way. But if you're married in a room and your spouse was there, you know that if they were sitting in the same room watching the same thing, they're going to pick up different highlights, right? And so in the Gospels, you get the same story, but some different things. We're going to start from John chapter 6. And this is a story that's mentioned four times. Like, like I said, this is anytime you see something mentioned like this, anytime you see repetition, I think it's worth our emphasis. Like when you see God say something once and then say it again and then say it again and then say it again, you may go, is there something here that God wants me to see? Is there something here that God wants me to know? In fact, I, I would even go further than that. You, maybe if you've been here at VMA, you've heard me talk about this, the law of first mention. Like I would even say, if you see God do something in the New Testament, oftentimes we'll go to the Old Testament and say, did God do that there? Did he say it there? Is this a pattern? Is this part of the characteristic of who God is? And so anytime you see repetition, what you're seeing is emphasis. And here's what you're seeing is read this. So today we're going to read this, okay? John chapter 6. After this, Jesus went away to the other side of the Sea of Galilee, which is the Sea of Tiberias. And a large crowd was following Jesus because they saw the signs, the miracles that he was doing to the sick. Jesus went up on the mountain, and there he sat down with his disciples. Now the Passover, the feast of the Jews, was at hand. Lifting up his eyes, then and seeing that a large crowd was coming towards him. So Jesus, he, he's already done some cool stuff, been healing people. He tries to leave, and as he leaves, you know what happens. If, if someone's walking around healing people and they walk off, you know what you're going to do? You're going to follow that guy. And so he starts walking off. He turns around. Guess what they're doing? They're following up the hill. And so this is what Jesus says to Philip, one of his disciples. He goes, where are we to buy bread so that these people may eat? And verse 6 says that Jesus said this to test him, for he himself knew what he would do. Isn't that kind of like God sometimes? Like, and you see this actually with Jesus, that he asks rhetorical questions. Someone asks him a question, his response is a question back. And so he asked Philip this question. Here you knew what he was going to do. He's like, I'm going to test. I'm going to see how my followers respond to this situation. I want to see what they see. I want to see what, they, what, their, what their faith is telling them. So verse 7 says, Philip answered him, 200 denarii worth of bread would not be enough for each of them to get a little. He said, so even if we had, uh, you know, this much money and we went and bought all the bread that the town had, it wouldn't be enough. And so verse 8 says, one of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, said to him, there is a boy here who has five barley loaves and two fish. But what are they for so many? I, what good is this, is this little mill going to do to feed all these people? Verse 10, Jesus said, have the people sit down. Now, there was so much grass in this place, so the men sat down, about 5,000 men. That's important to see there because it's just, he's numbering the men, and this is pretty uh, contextual. It's not a men versus women thing. It's not a sexual uh, thing of, 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 of gender roles or less than type of chauvinistic thing. This is just how they did it in that culture. They numbered the men, and so what we know is this was not 5,000 people. It's 5,000 men, which means it's probably fifteen to 20,000 people is what was there. And so the men set down 5,000 in number, about fifteen to 20,000 people. In verse 11, Jesus then took the loaves, and when he had given thanks, he distributed them to those who were seated. So he took this little boy's mill, he prayed over it, and they started handing it out. So also the fish, as much as they wanted. And when they had eaten their fill, he told the disciples, gather up the leftovers. So Jesus prays over this, this young boy's mill, blesses it, and then just starts handing it out, so much so that they were all full. Man, this is like the best kind of buffet. You don't even have to get up. Jesus just blesses it and hands it out, and the disciples are distributing it, right? Can you imagine going to a buffet that you don't have to get up? You just tell the server, bring me some more mac and cheese, come on. And this is, they just eat, and the food just keeps coming. So much so that that one little boy's lunch fed everyone, and then they gathered up the leftover fragments that nothing would be lost, so they gathered them up and filled 12 baskets with fragments from the five barley loaves left by those 
who had eaten. You know like you've had a good meal when your to-go box is heavy. Like that's what I, I love going somewhere where I eat a bunch and then I go home and I'm like, I got a whole nother meal here. That's a good day right there, right? And so this is what happens and this is a miraculous story. But here's what we see. Jesus does something miraculous. Mentioned in all four Gospels, it's got to be important. It's the only miracle that's mentioned in all four times. So why is this important? It's important because I think what Jesus is showing us, that he's a God of infinitely more. He can take a little and do a lot. He's a God, too, that also, when it comes to doing the miraculous, he does not leave us out of the equation. God is inviting us to participate, to be part of the process of there is more. In fact, Ephesians 3.20 says this. It says that we serve a God who is able with his mighty power at work within us to do infinitely more than we might ask or imagine. So we serve a God who is able, who has mighty power that can do more than we ask or imagine. It's, it's kind of easy to read over that one little line within us. That what the miracle that God wants to do oftentimes happens through the hands and through his people on this earth. And so today I'm going to give you three insights on how God invites us to participate in miracles. Here's the first one. God's invitation always starts with a need. So if God is inviting us to participate in a miracle, if there's a miracle to be had and, and, and God's inviting us, it always starts with a need. Jesus had been teaching all day. It was getting late. People were hungry. They needed to eat. This is a a very clear, a very obvious problem. I I would even, one of the the stories tells it a little bit different way. Mark's gospel says that the people were agitated and that the disciples were feeling the pressure. Disciples actually went to Jesus. So the people were hungry. There was a problem. There was a need. And it was obvious. And this is what I love about this. It's a very simple truth. But Jesus is different than us. Oftentimes, when we experience someone who's in need, we sometimes, in fact, some of us even avoid those people because we're not sure how to handle it. When someone's going through a loss, when someone experiences some heartbreak, sometimes we're not sure what to stay. So the, kind of our natural reaction, maybe sometimes when you pull up to the corner and there's a guy on the street with a sign, you just look ahead or you start messing with your radio. Like sometimes, oftentimes, as people, we're not really sure what to do when we see needs. But Jesus was not like us. When he sees a need, he steps right into the middle of it. In fact, Jesus, actually, if you read the Gospels, he doesn't just step into the middle of needs, he pursues needs. Jesus goes to the pool of Bethesda, he goes in this gate, and there's a man who had been lame for 30-something years. Jesus went to a gate that wasn't nearest where he was. He went around the city, went through a gate, walked in, healed this guy, walked back out. He went out of his way to bring healing to this one man who had been waiting for 30-something years. Jesus, on his way to Jerusalem, he's leaving the, the Galilee area, Capernaum area, and he's coming down, and then there's a city of Nun, is actually how you pronounce it, and he actually goes out of his way to go to the city. You know what was at that city? A widow whose son had just died. She has no husband, she has no son. She's mourning, and Jesus goes out of his way, goes to a city that's not on the path, brings this son back to life, then goes back on his way to Jerusalem. Jesus is not afraid of your needs. He's not scared of your needs. He's not intimidated by your needs. When you've got a problem, when you've got a need, you don't have a God who's trying to distance himself from it. You have a God who actually, in fact, Scripture tells us in Psalms that the Lord is near the brokenhearted. So he actually comes closer. He actually moves in when you have a need in your life. And here's, here's what I want us to see is that most of us in the room probably have some, who would be honest enough to say, I've got a problem or a need in my life? Who would be honest enough, like, I've got something I'm praying about, something I need some wisdom or help in? Who would, come on, raise your hands up high. We're not Baptists, we're not voting. It's just, I'm just asking. <laughs> I'm just asking, who here? Yeah, come on. And, and so, so if, if you raise your hand, here's the good news. The good news is this, if you have a problem, you're a candidate for a miracle. It's the prerequisite for God to do the miraculous. You have to have a need. In fact, some of us think, well, what the prerequisite for a miracle is faith. No, nope. before you need faith, you gotta have a problem. And so if you've got a problem, you're in a good place. If you've got a big problem, if you've got a big need, we serve a God who does some big miracles. And the only person in the room, I would say, the only person in the room that actually has a real problem is the person who doesn't think they have a problem because they're not trusting God. The, the only person in the room that really has a problem is the one who thinks I've got it under control. I, I'm okay. But those of us who recognize, we look at ourselves and we look at our situation, we look at our families, we look at our marriage, we look at our finances, whatever it is, and we go, God, I need some help. We're the ones that are, we, we are taking step one 
That's step one to be able to step into the miracle, is to recognize you've got a need. And so right now, I would say Vima Church is a great candidate for a, a, a move of God. We are running out. Our, our lease is coming up in May, and so we can stay longer if we need to, but we really don't want to because the condition of the building, like we've got a problem. We, we're running out of space. We're at three services. We've got a great need. You know what that means? We're a candidate for a miracle of God. Amen? And so you're believing for a miracle, we're believing for a miracle. And someone told me, well, pastor, that's a great problem, that you're growing and that you're having to do three services and you're having salvations, you're having baptisms, and you got kids everywhere, the nursery is blowing up like crazy. In fact, we had two babies born this week. I, I mean, I'm telling you, there's babies everywhere. Uh, Brad, our worship guy, they had their baby this week, and, and, and so, yeah, come on. And, uh, uh, and so, like, man, that's, this is what I've, I've been told this so many times, it's driving me crazy. Pastor, that's a great problem. You know what? It's a great problem if it's your problem, but it's my problem, and it's not a great problem. <laughs> this, is, this is what I've wanted to say, but I've not said it, but I'll say it to you because you're my friends. This is what I've wanted to say to every person that said that, Pastor, that's a great problem. I want to say, if it's so good, then why don't you share it with me? If you think this is such a good problem, why don't you come be part of the solution? Come on now. Like, we're going to take an offering in a few weeks, and now we'll allow you to come. If this problem is so good, come on and participate. Come on, somebody. And so the need is great, and if you've got a great need, this is good news. We serve a God who is able. Here's a second invitation. God's invitation is always sensed by his followers. If God's about to do something, if there's a miracle, if there's something, if there's a need, his people, his followers, they're always sensing it. Uh, in fact, I had a, a pastor one time years ago, great pastor, and they had a great outreach program in this church. And I, I asked him, I said, how do you know if you're, because they, they just, man, they did so much for outreach. I said, how do you know if you're like an outreach church? He goes, John, I don't, I don't really think there's a calling. He goes, I, don't, like, I didn't like wake up one day and be like, we need to do more of this. He goes, I just like literally where our church is positioned, all of these needs are around us. And this is what he said I thought was brilliant. He said, sometimes the call is just the need. He said, I just, I just looked out where our church is positioned and where their church was positioned. There was a lot of homelessness. There was a lot of brokenness. It was a, a low-income area. He's like, so we didn't become this outreach-driven church because this was necessarily like what God spoke to me in a dream. We just like show up to work every day and realize this is where God put us. There's a need right there, and we're right here, so let's, get, let's be part of it. And, and so there's a sensing, there's an invitation, there's a sensing, a discernment for the people of God. That, and this is what the disciples experienced. They saw this. In Mark's gospel, it says that they saw it, and Mark's gospel says they brought it to Jesus. And, and, and this is what we do with our problems. We bring our problems to Jesus. We come to Jesus and say, God, I got a problem. God, I need your help. God, I'm not sure what I'm going to do in this situation. God, I need your healing. God, I need you to move. God, I need your wisdom. God, I need a, a miracle. God, I need this. I need this. I need this. But instead of a miracle, oftentimes, I believe sometimes, maybe not oftentimes, but sometimes we're not actually asking God for a miracle. What we're asking for is a magic trick. I'll explain the difference. A magic trick, a magician takes a hat and pulls a rabbit out of it. No participation from the crowd is necessary. But what God does is he takes a bunch of people and he takes a couple of loaves and a couple of fish. He invites the participation of the people. And, and there's a difference between asking for a miracle, because when you're asking for a miracle, you have this discernment, there's a call, there's a need, and is there something that I can do? And as the church, as Vima Church, this is one of the things I'm the most proud about our church. We are a church that sees needs and we respond. Every time I've ever said, church, man, it would be great if we could do something like this. You guys just give, you show up, you serve. Hey, what if we did an egg hunt out in the middle of the city at the, at the parks? You guys show up, you stuff eggs. Thousands of people are loved on. I said, wouldn't it be cool if we planted a church in Peru? You guys just give. Some of you showed up, helped us do some things there. I said, man, wouldn't it be cool if we, like, if we had this goal that every kid in Christmas has something under the tree? Last year, you guys showed up 250 gifts for kids in foster care that you guys put under the tree for them. And so this is, I love this. You guys do this. You have a sense of the need of our city and you start to lean into it. And this is what we see in this story. But the disciples, they, they didn't see it. They, they asked Jesus, what are you going to do about it? And I love how Mark gospel, it says this was Jesus' response. So Jesus answered them. He says, you give them something to eat. Jesus, you got a problem. All these people are hungry, and this 200 denarii, it's not going to be enough. I don't know what we're going to do. And Jesus goes, why don't you just do it? And I'm sure they're going, yeah, but we're just fishermen, and like even if we went out and fished all night, we wouldn't be able to get enough to feed all these people. 
you're the son of God. All these people are here because you're healing, because you're doing miracles. So what we're asking is, would you do something? And I, I love Jesus' response. He says, you do something. You get involved. You be part of the miracle. And time and time again, we see that this is a truth from God, is that what God does miraculously on the earth, he chooses to do through his people. I'll show you. There was a giant. He was terrorizing Israel, challenging Israel. And what did God send? God sent a shepherd boy. And what did he send them with? No mighty sword, no mighty army. He sends them with a sling. God sends this giant and he's terrorizing and a boy with a sling shows up and brings victory to the people of Israel. Moses rescues the people of God. He thinks he's doing all of a sudden what's happened. Pharaoh's coming behind him and there's a Red Sea in front of him. And what does God have? God already put a staff in his hand. Moses puts the staff down towards the water. What happens? The Red Sea split. God chooses to work through a man. He does the miraculous. There's nothing special about a sling. There's nothing special about that stick. But God chose to work through it. I mean, there's time and time again where we see that God chooses Gideon in the army. God says, hey, raise up an army, you mighty warrior. And Gideon's like, me? Are you sure? He's like, yes, you. Gideon tries a couple times to get out of it. Doesn't get out of it. So Gideon takes this army, raises up 30,000 guys. God says, that's too many. That's too many. He ends up with 300. And how does Gideon defeat him? Not by wielding a sword. He defeats him with a pot and a, a clay pot and a candle in it and some trumpets. And they surround him in the middle of the night. They blow those trumpets, those break those pots. They think they're surrounded. They start killing each other. This is the kind of God that we serve. He doesn't need you to do a bunch. He just needs you to do something. And, and, and this is what Jesus is telling the disciples. Like, I, I, like what are, what's your part that you're going to play? What are you going to do in this? And, and there's, this, there's a miracle I believe that God wants to do. And the invitation is for you. Do you want to be part of the miracle that God wants to do? He's inviting us into it. That's why as followers of Christ, we start to sense these things. We start to discern these things. We might see problems different than the rest of the world. We don't go, who's going to fix this? We gotta start going, is there something that I'm supposed to do? And I'll tell you that, yes, absolutely. And God's invitation, the next thing for us is it always requires faith. Always requires faith. So then the next thing, once we discern, once we see the problem, once we discern that something needs to be done, then the next thing for us to do is to take a step of faith. I love what it says in verse 8. It says, one of the disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, said to him, Hey, 200 denarii is not going to get it cut. We can't go fish on that. That's not going to work. But there's this boy, and he's got five barley loaves and two fish. It, isn't that a, just, it's even an odd thing to even say out loud. Like, God, I know you're powerful. You sent Jesus here, and he's doing all these miracles. I'm not sure how we're going to do this. 200 denarii is not going to get it cut, but we do have this boy's sack lunch. We, this is what we've got. This is, this is where we are. And, and they were looking for a solution. And when they started looking for a solution, they started recognizing maybe there's something Jesus wants us to do because he asked us, what did we have? How are we going to find it? What they found was this boy. We don't know his name. We don't know his story. Uh, we, what we can probably assume is with two fish and a couple loaves, it's probably his meal for the day. And, and But here's what we see is this boy was willing to give it up. This little boy didn't need the miracle because he had food. So all these other people didn't have food, but the little boy had food. He didn't need the miracle, but he was willing to give up what he had so that other people could have a miracle. And, and this, is a, this is what we see right here. This is the level of faith where he goes, this is all I have, but I'm going to put it in the hands of Almighty God. I'm going to take what little I have, and I'm going to put it in his hands, and I'm going to see if he can do infinitely more. And this is what Ephesians says, that we serve a God who is able through his mighty power work within us. There's a part to play that within us that he can do infinitely. We can't do infinitely more, but when we take what little we have and we offer it to him, then all of a sudden he can start to do miraculous things. This is the principle. This is the story. This is what Jesus is showing them. The little boy gave up his lunch so that others could eat. He entrusted it to Jesus. He put it in the hands of someone who could do more. What he did is he took a step of faith. And so I, I recognize that as Christians, as believers, we've probably heard this story. And this is that we, we know these principles in the, in the story of faith. But sometimes even knowing these things, it can still be hard to give up our lunch. Like we can know that God is a God who does more. And if we're willing to, we can amen it. We are, maybe our hearts are being stirred like, yes, yes, amen. John, pastor, that's good, that's good. But in the end, it's like it can still be a little bit hard to go, but, but that's my food. <laughs> what am I going to eat? And so I want to help us today. I want to answer this question. I want to give us a couple thoughts on this. Why is it hard to give up our lunch? Why is it hard sometimes to, 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 to do these things? I'll say this. Number one, it's easier to ignore others when we're comfortable. 
This little boy had a lunch. He could have snuck off to behind a tree and just started chowing down, and he would have been fine for the day. And so he had what he needed. And so some might say to me, and I've heard this, not from you guys, but some other people out and around, why does Vima need to grow bigger? Why do we need a permanent church home? It's big enough for us. Why can't we just stay here? And I'll tell you this, that language, those words are the words of a comfortable person. They're the words of someone who's already been reached, not considering those who have yet to come. They've already got their lunch. They're not considering those that aren't eating. And, and, and this was not the, the response of the little boy. The little boy says, this is what I got, but what if I put it in the hands of Jesus? And, and so we can't be comfortable. And, and this is not just about did we find a church. It's not just about did we find a family. It's not just about did we find some great kids ministry or did we find a great student ministry for our kids to plug in. It's not just did I find a good small group or, or do I like the worship here. It's not just about that. It's also about who's yet to come. And we can't get comfortable, and I'll tell you this, as a church, I, I hope that we always stay a little uncomfortable. I hope that we never get to the place that we're like, oh, finally we did it. Because the second we come to that, we need to change what's on the wall out there that says to see Wichita experience the real Jesus, and it just needs to say until I get to experience the real Jesus. And, and so we can't be comfortable. We've got to be willing to be uncomfortable. We've got to be willing to, to grow again, to see more souls saved, to see more people baptized, to see more marriages restored. It can't just be enough for us to experience it. We've got to want it for others. We've got to want to see what God's done for us, see God do it for them too. And I'll tell you, this is just the beginning. This is the first of many uncomfortable conversations as a church because we feel called to what God feels called to, which is to reach people. So we got to be uncomfortable. Number two, why well, is it easy to give up our lunch? I think God often asks us to do things that don't make sense. So sometimes it can be hard to give something up because you're like, this doesn't make sense. The math does not add up. Think about this, 5,000 men and their families, about 20,000 people versus one boy's little lunch. Allen Fieldhouse, KU Jayhawks, seats 16,300 people. Imagine if that whole thing was full and if I walked in with my McDonald's filet fish value meal, right? The fish and the bread, right? I got it. filet fish I say, I supersized it, everybody. Don't worry, I splurged. <laughs> I got the extra large fries, got an extra large Dot Dr. Pepper, and I even put two filets on that sandwich. Come on, somebody. If you've never done that, it'll change your life. They can do it. But this is, imagine the boy walking in, that literally, that size, that many people, around that and saying, this is what I got. It doesn't make sense. It, it almost, it's almost embarrassing to think that I could help. You almost get this awkward feeling like, does God really need me? Is this, is this really going to do that much? And so the math in the kingdom of God doesn't always make sense. Faith gives because God asked for it, not because it makes sense. We, we take steps of faith because God spoke to us and we do what he asked us to do, not because the math makes sense. Now, God doesn't look at our, I, I firmly believe this, God's not looking at your, at your lunch. He's not looking at your wallet, and he's, he, what he's looking at is your faith and obedience. He's not counting the dollars in your wallet right now. God's not doing that. Don't feel that pressure from God. God, God doesn't live that way. He doesn't act that way. He's got a thousand hills with a thousand cattle on him. His streets are paved with gold. He doesn't need what you have. The invitation is for you to participate and get to see what you have be part of a miracle. Have you ever thought about this, that little boy? And goes home that day, and at the end of the day, he gets home, and his mom and dad's like, hey, how was lunch? He's like, it was amazing. And like, really? I, th I thought I did pretty good on the fish this morning, but I didn't realize it was that good. I did add a little cumin, and that's not normal. And so maybe, he's like, no, not that, mom. That's not why it was amazing. It was amazing because I gave it away. Well, why would that be amazing? Because I got to see this guy. This guy do something. Like, he was doing things with other people, but when I gave him my fish, and I gave him my bread, he he broke it. He prayed over it. And then he fed people. And she's like, okay, cool. No, he fed a lot of people. Oh, okay, cool. He fed 20,000 people. Imagine the story that this young man got to tell because he got to say, look what I got to be a part of because I was willing to take what I had and put it in the hands of Almighty God and say, God, could you do more with it than what I could? Now, if it were me, I could break it apart. I could ration this out. I could feed four or five people. I could even be, look at myself and go, look, I'm, look how generous I'm being. I fed four or five people with what I have. But what happens if I take with what little I have and I don't just try to be generous on my own, but I put it in the hands of Almighty God and I say, God, what can you do? And this is what we get to see. Thousands of people are fed. And so here's the principle that we see is that God multiplies 
what you offer him. Whatever you're willing to give, this is the principle that's in the Bible, God can do more with it than what you can. In fact, Scripture, Jesus tells us this, if you're faithful with little, he can do much. Jesus said this, if you have the faith of a mustard seed and you speak to that mountain to move, it'll move. Just a little. If you just trust God a little. So next week for us as a church is, is what we're calling Pledge Sunday. It's a Sunday where we're going to come and we're going to look at this there's more commitment as a church and go, man, we believe that God's calling our church to do some big things. And God, what are you asking me to do as the participant? God, if I'm, if I'm the boy and I'm in the crowd, am I, am I willing to jump into this thing? And our, the, the question that, that I'm asking all of us to ask is like, what's in my lunch? What, what, why do I have? What's, what do I have to give? And what do I have to, be, to participate? And this is the three-year commitment that we're making. And when we, when we make these steps and we do these things, what we're asking is, God, can you multiply it? God, it really comes down to not what I have. God, it comes down to what happens when I put it in your hands. And, and here, here's a great example of this. I don't know if any of you guys know. I'm going to give you a couple of names. You've probably never heard of any of these people. Chad Pennington, Chris Redman, Mark Bulger, T. Martin, Spurgeon Wynn. All these guys have one thing in common. Anyone know what they have in common? They were all drafted as quarterbacks before Tom Brady. Tom Brady, sixth-round draft pick, 199th pick. Tom Brady, a football in my hands in the backyard in the fall on Thanksgiving weekend, throwing around with my brothers is fun for a few minutes. A football in the hands of Tom Brady turns into seven Super Bowl champions. Like, there's something to be said of what's in our hands versus what's in the God's hand. And, and that's a really cool example. Tom Brady is cool and all, but God is much cooler. <laughs> but it's a great example of what happens when something's in the right person's hands. What happens when we trust God and when we listen to God's voice and we hear the Lord speak to us and, and God says, hey, would you give me your lunch? Would you put what you have in my hands and let me do something miraculous with it? I believe when we do that, when we trust God, when we say, God, I'm trusting for you to do the miraculous. God, this is natural. It's what I have, but I'm putting it in your hands. And I'm asking for something supernatural, which by the way, is every time we sow seed, that's what we're doing. Every time in, in the practical, when you put seed in the ground, you're saying, I can't see what it's doing, but I'm trusting trusting that something is happening, something that I don't have control over. I'm trusting that God is going to bring the sun and God is going to bring the rain. And at the end, that there's going to be a harvest. And this is what this little boy did. God, this is all I have and I'm going to put it in your hands. I have no idea how it's going to work, but I'm trusting you. And this always, in the kingdom, it always comes down to, to one thing. And it's about people. He told Peter, Peter, he says, I'm going to make you fishers of men. Uh, it's about people. Like the, the, my whole purpose, Jesus says, my whole purpose for training you guys for three years is to teach you how to reach people, to teach you how to preach the gospel to people. And he puts churches like ours in communities like this. Why? Because he cares about people. Hey, turn your attention to the screen. I want to show you a quick story about how God moved in some people here at Vima. My name's Amy Tiener. I'm Matt Tiener. We serve on the uh, guest services go team here at Vima. Yeah. So guest services, greeting team, pretty much wherever Madison and the rest of the team find a spot for me, that's where I want to go. We're sitting there watching YouTube videos during COVID, church shopping. After it was over, we sat and had probably an hour to two hour discussion about what we heard. This is one of the first times where after we hear a message, we're really engaging in a dialogue. Like it obviously stirred something within us and I haven't really found that anywhere else. That kind of was a difference maker. There's great messages all over Wichita, but this one really hit us in our marriage, hit us in our hearts, put us closer together. Part of the conversation for figuring out that this was the church for us was we jumped online and looked oh, at the yeah. website. You would think that most Christian churches identify with the same kind of values, but when you look at their areas of focus that Pastor John, Stephanie, and the rest of the team bring about here, oh, this is their commitment. These are the things that they're 100% passionate about. And then you show up here and it's not just words on a website. They repeat it over and over again. So it's a part of who we are. We had an eight year journey of infertility. I think it's safe to say we've been through every emotion with our trials to have children, jealousy, depression, hope, sadness, anger. I mean, being in anguish before the Lord, like why? Why is it still no? Right before we started coming to Vima, I became pregnant and I, I told God, we've done everything that a person can do, that humans can do, that money can buy. This is the best I can do. You're gonna have to do the rest because I have exhausted my power. And I think that's the first time that I really did give it to God. I said, you, you, you have to do the rest because I can't. And then you get this beautiful little, little guy, you know, and you know, where am I gonna take him? 
You know, there's so many dangerous places out here. And then here comes, you know, the VEMA kids ministry. I know that you can get a kids ministry anywhere, but I 100% feel safe having my kids here. Yeah. They're gonna take care of them. And on not only are they gonna take care of them, keep them safe, but they're getting washed with the word. Vima is a great place to bring your children. And when I see my son doing genuine praise hands in the back seat of yeah. the car and saying Bible verses, and uh, you know, it just it really warms my heart. And I, I trust them to take care of our kids. There's things that are available here that I haven't found anywhere else, whether it's the marriage seminars yeah. and things like that, that are intentionally trying to solidify those bonds between husband and wife. This is what a marriage is supposed to look like. This is what your interactions with people are supposed to look like. This is how we're supposed to be interacting. I, where else am I going to get that? I don't want to go anywhere else. I don't want Wichita without Vima. This place is awesome. My name is Amy Come on now, how Tiener. awesome is that story? I'm Matt Tiener. I love the Tieners. Are, are they in this service? I saw them out serving. Are y'all in here this service? No, I think they're, oh yeah, there's, there's Amy right there. I saw them out there. Love you guys. Thank you guys for sharing that with us. I love what Amy said. God, this is the best I can do. You're going to have to do the rest. And essentially, that's what this kind of comes down to. This journey is like, God, I, I trust you. This is what I have. This is, this is where I'm at. This is what I've had. And so, God, what I'm asking you to do is more and do more and do more than what I can think. And so today, if you would, you can take your little paper bag out and grab these right now. If you got them, you should have got them when you came in today. This is your sack lunch. There's no food in it, um, reluctantly. Uh, I have to tell you that today. Someone asked me, is there donuts in there? I was like, no, there's no donuts in there. It's a pledge card. So in the sack lunch, every one of us, when we came in, this is the fish and bread. Every one of us have fish and bread. And this is, this is how we believe. You can tear it open. It's fine. It's trash afterwards. We're not trying to can save them for anything. But the little card that's in there is, is one we've had on your seats the last few weeks. As a church, as a family, I told you that there's defining moments that we make individually, but as a church, this is our defining moment together. And this right here is our fish and our loaves. This is our fish and bread. The little boy, he took what he had. He had enough. He had enough to eat. And this is what he said. He goes, I, and this is what we see in the story. He was willing to give up what he had so that others could eat. And what we're calling our church into is a season of sacrifice, a season of trusting the Lord, a season of, of giving above and beyond more than, many what, more than what many of us ever have before. And why are we doing that? We're giving up what we have so that others can eat. It, it, the, the, what I'm inviting you to is not just to participate in a building project. I'm not, I'm not that concerned with buildings I'm not that concerned with stuff. I'm not that concerned. We've been here for four and a half, five years. And sometimes the heater works. Sometimes the air conditioner works. It's kind of fun. It's like playing the lottery, going to VMA church. Do I need a jacket or a fan today? I don't know. Show up ready. That doesn't even bother me that much. I kind of like it. Kind of fun. It's kind of a grit to it. So this is not about a building. This is about people. It, it, the little boy gave up his food, not because of the food, because he wanted to see other people get to eat that day. And so I want you to just draw your attention. We're not filling these out today, so don't, don't, you don't need a pen or anything. But I, I just want to show you how we're going to interact with this next week. At the top of this, on the front of it, it says, there's a little paragraph. It says, we believe that this is a defining moment in the history of our church. We prayerfully commit to step out in faith and pledge the following above our regular tithe. And in that, it has a place for you to write your total three-year gift. And then it has different ways. If you're going to give weekly, you're going to give monthly, you're going to give once a year, every year for three years, or maybe it's just a one-time gift. And then there's even a section on the bottom, donations or other assets, stocks, crypto, things like that. We can accept in-kind gifts. So anything that has value, we can accept and, and sell and, and, and to be able to help do this. So that's all on there. But that entire portion of the card is basically our, our loaves and our fish. This is us. And today I'm not asking you to fill this out, but I would ask you to flip it over on the back. And I want to show you, this may help you kind of see on the back side what, what maybe. This may be how you can pray and start to ask. I told you last week, I believe that God's going to speak to us. This may be how you start to pray, maybe as a couple or as an individual. God, where are you, where are you calling me to participate? And you can see it's really easily broken down, the weekly, the monthly, or the three-year total. God, where are you calling me to participate? God, what's the next thing you're calling me to do? 
And I'll tell you this, there's three levels of giving. So when you're looking at these numbers, I think there's three ways to look at it. There's three ways to pray. There's three ways to kind of look at your fish and loaves this morning. And level one is this. And this is a question you should all ask. What can I afford? It's a practical question. It's a discerning question. This is a, a wisdom-based question. And this question is about going, what can I afford? What can I give? And, and, and not really change anything in my life. Because there's probably some discretionary income for most of us around. We have some discretionary income. We can give up a Chipotle and it wouldn't really cost us anything. Like I can just only eat it twice a week instead of three times a week or whatever. I don't eat it that many times. But I'm just giving you an example. Like so some of us, there's something I can afford. You might be able to look at your finances and go, oh, I can make this commitment. But then there's the next question some of us may be asking is what can I sacrifice? And this goes to a different level. And this is when I start to ask, what can I give if I'm willing to make some cuts? Uh, this is something that, that we've talked about a little bit in our household. It's like, hey, if we turned off Netflix, if we turned off YouTube, if we turned off Amazon Prime, if we've turned off three or four of these things for the next couple of years, we can increase what we're giving per month by a couple hundred dollars. And so that's a sacrifice. That's like, hey, we don't have to have those things. I'll come watch football games at your house on Sunday afternoons. I'm serious. I'm going to need a place to come watch the football game. Okay? Y'all are laughing. No, I'm serious. And like, so there's maybe some sacrifices. You can, you can talk about yourself. What's some things we can go live without so we can make a, 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 bigger, a, a bigger, better, a good gift for this project? But then there's a third question. This is the one I'm going to ask all of us, a challenge I'm going to ask all of us, is what can I trust God to do through me? And this, this question starts to go, what, what, what can I give if I trust God as my source? And in fact, I, I've got a story I'm going to share it with you next week where uh, a family I was talking to, God asked them to give something, not just a sacrifice, but above where they even are financially. And they feel like God spoke clearly to them. I'm going to share the story with you. But I believe that God may ask us to do something that doesn't make sense. I'm going to give up my, the little boy gave up his whole lunch so that others could eat. And this requires God to do above and beyond. And I believe that God can do this. And so these are three questions I think every one of us should ask. And I'm asking the church next week, we're going to come together. It's Pledge Sunday. And I'm asking you to take this card this next week, hold it, pray over it. If you've got a spouse, grab their hand and start asking God. And I believe God is a communicator. God, where are you, where, where are you speaking to me? What are you calling me to do? God, if all I've got is this fish and loaves, this is what I love about the fish and loaves. It wasn't a lot. It, it's not a lot. It's not about how much. It's about how much, not about how much something costs. It's about how much you're willing to give. You look at the women, woman, Jesus caught, saw her give. He pointed out to her disciples, he goes, she gave more than everyone else. All she gave was just two, two little coins. Her disciples were perplexed by that. How, how is it that she gave more than anyone else? And Jesus goes, because she gave all that she had. And so it's not that we're looking for everyone to, to make it an equal gift. What we're asking you to do is make an equal sacrifice. As a church, for us to all look at this at, through the same lens, what God, what could you do if I gave you some fish and some bread?